Hi, my name is Keith Cooper and in uh, this video I'm going to talk about something I noticed when doing some testing of recent lenses, cameras, whatever, and it's about modern lens design and the free lunch. W what do I mean by the free lunch? Well, uh, there are a lot of classic design compromises that you make when you design lenses. And um, it, for a long while, it's been thought that you could make one bit better, another bit would be worse, and it was always a matter of compromise. Well, things have changed a bit, um, and it's to do with software. Uh, different aspects of software, how they affect lens design, how they affect lens use. Now I'm going to go through a load of examples here. Uh, this is not a treatise on optical design. Um, so my apologies to any optical designers out there if I cut a, a little fast and loose with some of the principles of optical design. Um, I'm trying to get the idea across uh, in practical terms what it actually means. What was the particular thing that kicked it off. Well, I've been testing the new Lauer 19mm f2.8 prime lens. On this, the GFX 100S, 100 megapixel uh, medium format sensor. That's the small medium format, not the large medium format. So there's a slight difference. This one covers as a, an image circle. That's the picture projected at the back of the uh, lens uh, that's more than enough to cover the sensor of this. So it's 19 millimeters, roughly equivalent to about 14 on 35 mil. So a, an ultra wide lens and um, ultra wide lenses have a number of sort of typical distortions you expect in them. And, you know, they've been around for a while. Um, I had a Canon EF14 that I used a lot. That one worked well. Um, but this one is a completely manual lens, there's no electronics in it. So what was it that sort of got me thinking about this? Apart from somebody did ask a question on one of the comments on this, and I, and I say it regularly, please do ask questions on these videos, because quite often the questions that people ask are what sort of set me off on ideas for making other videos. So I do appreciate that. But anyway, here's the picture. Uh, this is one of the test pictures, it's from the review, taken with the Lauer 19mm. Now I can't remember, I think this is at f5.6. Uh, there is quite pronounced uh, vignetting on it. Um, it's lighter in the middle than the dark, uh, but the geometry of it, and I've taken a picture of this building deliberately to show any distortions in the geometry, so that's whether that sort of barrel distortion or pin cushion distortion that you get in, in uh, lenses, um, there's very little geometrical distortion. We've got quite a bit of vignetting. So I thought, well, this is not a bad lens. Then, because I've got the uh, Fuji 20 to 35 zoom here, F4, um, I thought, we'll take a picture with that and take some pictures and just do a quick comparison. And I did the quick comparison and the picture was completely different. We've got no vignetting. We've got even less geometric distortion. It's absolutely bang on straight. Um, I thought, wow, this is an incredibly good lens. I thought, hang on a minute though. There should be some vignetting. There should be, you always get that on a lens. I was like, what's going on here? I hadn't checked. When I processed the raw image and I looked at it and I saw this. Um, it has barrel distortion and vignetting um, and it's really not that great a view, geometrically speaking. It's quite sharp, um, but geometrically speaking, um, there are all kinds of distortions in it. So what's going on? Well, the camera does correction to the JPEGs. It knows the lens, it knows the characteristic of the lens, so the camera is correcting for some distortions in the lens. And that's making the difference between that picture there and the undistorted version that I originally got out of my conversion from the RAW. Now I was using Adobe Camera RAW and it had defaulted to including the conversion. Now normally I don't have the conversions when I'm looking at lenses because I want to see what the actual lens is like before any conversions are applied. But here we've got here and that's the original and that's what we're getting out of it. Well that's pretty good. Um, it suggests that in general use, 
if you're going to be using the raw files or the JPEGs out of this, you're going to get extremely good results. And it confirms what a lot of people have said in that the 2035 is an excellent lens. Now, given that this one costs two and a half thousand pounds and this one will cost under a thousand, there's quite a difference. Now, this has uh, it's a zoom. So I haven't tested it in, for this instance at other focal lengths, but the distortions will be different at different focal lengths. Um, this one is a really good lens because we're using the, distort, yeah, the corrections in here and in the image processing software. So what do we get inside these lenses? Yeah, are they that different? Well, if I look in turn, and this is a shot at detail, by the way, um, I've optimally processed each image from each lens. That's the 2035 at 5.6 and that's the 19 at 5.6 after I've done various corrections on the lower as well uh, in Camera Raw in Photoshop. Now there is very little difference. They're both good sharp lenses. Might I give a slight nudge to the lens that costs two and a half times the other one here? Yes, I might. But the 19's doing very well. So, you know, what are the lenses like inside? Well, here's Fuji give a nice sort of cutaway diagram showing all the different bits of glass that live inside this lens here. And it's quite a complex design. It's not too complex. It's, it's got quite a lot. The different colors, I'm gonna presume, refer to different types of glass. And if I look at the lower, we've got a, another a very complex design. Now, this has got low dispersion glass, a spherical optics, so that's um, glass curves which aren't normal spherical shaped, um, much more difficult to create. Uh, they use molding techniques, they use special grind, lens grinding. These are not optical elements you could have produced a few years ago. Um, and they have uh, a very high refraction glass in it as well. So you've got lots of different glass types. In some ways, the 19 has, you know, for a prime, has a more complex design than the 20 to 35. The 2035, for what it does, is a relatively simple design. I say relatively simple. These optics are, are difficult to work. So, you know, actually working out this sort of stuff is, is lens design is very, very tricky. Now, what have we got? that's sort of trade-offs between them. I said that you know, when you design lenses, you have a trade-off between uh, various aspects of design. Well, typically for wide angle lenses here, you can correct for a number of distortions. Now, uh, chromatic aberration, which is where there are false colors, and I'll show an example on another lens in a bit on that, is where there are colored edges on things, has been around for a long while. That can be corrected partly by the use of appropriate glasses, and that will virtually eliminate chromatic aberration if you want. But in the process of eliminating chromatic aberration, you may introduce other distortions. So with this particular lens, as seen from the examples of it, it's very good geometrically speaking. So things are straight, you know, straight lines are straight line. They're not curved. There's no obvious distortion. That It's a good rectilinear lens, rectilinear straight lines. So it's an excellent lens for that. Given there's no electronics or anything in it, it's going to limit what you could do if in camera correction anyway. But, you know, it's a good lens. It's been produced to be a good lens. Now, one of the problems is that if you try and fix chromatic aberration and um, geometry and focal plane flatness so that focus is even across the field, if you try and bring all these things together, you make compromises and the compromises could come in introducing another aberration that's called coma. That's an off-axis one, which if you take pictures of stars in the corners, it will stretch them out into little shapes. Now, you can guess this to some extent if you look at the MTF diagrams, but I'm not going to go into MTF charts and things. You'll see them in reviews and various things. I put them in my reviews for people who want to have a look at them. They can be useful, but uh, they can also give you a lot of false impressions as well. So I don't really you know, want to go into the MTF charts, but that's how I would yeah, that, that's a complex lens there. Now, I just as testing this one, because several people asked me how this, because it's an f2.8 lens, how good it was for photographing stars. Now, I looked a few years ago and I got a review of the uh, 0D, or 
zero, no distortion, low distortion lenses line up from Alawa. About five years ago, I looked at a 12 millimeter lens on 35 mil and the 12 millimeter lens on that was great. Similarly low distortion, very low chromatic aberration. But when I took star photos, there was distinct coma visible as slight distortions towards the edge of the field. Now that doesn't show, that's just a view, quick view I took out of the, out of our loft window just to check this. But using what I've got here, and this is my star simulator. Um, it's a laser pointer. There is a diffuser over it, a bit of tape just put over there just to you know, diffuse the light from it and a piece of silver foil on it. And the silver foil on it, or the aluminium foil, has with a very fine sewing needle had a tiny pinprick made into it so that when this uh, lights up, and there we go, and I'm not sure whether that will show, how that will show on the video, if at all. So here's my uh, artificial star and I use this for testing because um, well it's cold and I live in a big city so getting star photos is not. Here's an example of what the image looks like off axis. Now that's just whole pixels and it shows a typical sort of bat wing coma. There's, there's lots of different styles of how coma appears in images and this is a sort of typical bat wing one. Now the source here this is dead easy to use. Um, that it's bright enough you can use it in daylight even. It's excellent for testing lenses for um, astro use. If you want to test it just make up a little tester like this and you can test in daylight as to whether your lenses are going to be give you sharp star images. It's also good for focus adjustment because focus autofocus systems in, and especially manual focus systems like this are not great on getting exact precise focus without a bit of effort zooming out. So if you can set that in daylight and lock it, uh, then sometimes it's easier to use something like this. If that's too bright, you can use something like a green LED like that. And the green LED gives you a source, another source, not as bright as the laser. Um, so it makes it a bit easier to do indoors if you're doing testing like that. But anyway, that, that's just some basic testing. So back to the lens aberrations. What I've got is a lens here that's really good in geometry, really good in chromatic aberration, but coma, mm, it's a bit soft in the corners because of the coma. Um, and that's just the trade-offs you get in lens design. Now, you know, that's in looking at stars, so it's quite a specific thing. And this comes back to the main point I was making about the free lunch. Software has been the big game changer in lens design. We are in, I've heard it, several people describe it as a golden age of lens design. Lens designs these days are produced which were impossible 10, 15 years ago. Uh, computational, computer-aided design for optics has advanced so far in terms of the calculations that can be done, as well as the extra glasses that are available now and things like that. But in terms of the calculations that can be done, optics is absolutely superb now compared to what it used to be. Coatings have improved, um, different types of glass are used, but more complex shapes of glass are used in lenses. So we've got that. That's one aspect of the software. The other aspect is what's going on when I was using this 2035 lens, and that is software correction is now much easier to incorporate in cameras and in raw processing software. Previously, you could have sort of fairly broad corrections for vignetting and things like that, and maybe chromatic aberration. But now you can get an awful lot more uh, corrections included in software. And this kind of software can be built into the camera even. What does that allow lens designers to do? It allows them some of those trade-offs that uh, in the past they would make. So you would look for geometrical correction. You can go, okay, we're not so bothered about the geometrical correction because that's a relatively easy one to do in software. So if we're not that bothered about geometric correction and accuracy. How does it allow us to improve other aspects of the lens? So we can go for fine detail, we can go for flatness of focal plane, we can go for reducing coma, all kinds of aspects that, that improve overall lens quality, but in this instance, perhaps at the cost of distortion, of a lens you know, that produces a picture that is just 
uh, yeah, I wouldn't like it. It's too obviously distorted. Yeah, the software fixes it. So there you go. That's the free lunch. Um, the software is allowing you to fix things that so you don't have to worry about them. So you can concentrate elsewhere. So we've got CID, CAD design for optics. We've got software correcting this. Is this of any use for old lenses? Well, actually, yes, um, I do. You know, I've got quite a few. I've done a few videos and I've got quite a few collections of old lenses. Now, this particular one here is a Zeiss 135mm f3.5. Um, it's a really nice little lens, manual lens. Um, I've used this It's 35mm it's screw fit. So I've used this on several different cameras and it's quite a nice lens to use. Um, is it the greatest look? No, but I quite like the look I get from some of the pictures we've taken. It's, it's easy to use. And here's an example. Um, this one has distinct longitudinal chromatic aberration. So that means if you focus on something, things focused beyond, things beyond the point of focus have a slight greenish tinge. Things closer than that have a slight purplish tinge. Now, the example here shows it on these swans, but that is quite easily correctable. Uh, you can't, it's not quite as easy as some. You do need to get rid of, uh, you adjust the fringing settings in, so say Adobe Camera Raw or something like that. And it can make pictures like this quite acceptable, but you do have to be on the lookout for it. And obviously, since there are no electronics in this, there are no there's no EXIF data stored for the image, and it's that EXIF data which is used for driving software correction. So I've looked at the past in the past for several versions of DxO Optics Pro and now Photolab as it is, and that has very complex lens corrections built into it, and it can take care of all kinds of distortions. But the downside of Photolab is that with a lens like this, because there's no EXIF, because as far as the camera is concerned, there is no lens attached to the camera. With a lens like this, there's no details of the settings, the aperture, the focus, anything like that. So the software needs that to do the best correction. So that means for lenses like this, they're just not supported, which is a, it's a pity because DxO Optics Pro is really good if the lens and camera is supported. It does some excellent corrections, some really quite subtle corrections in terms of detail and getting fixing distortion, but it won't work with something like the Lower 19, certainly won't work with this old 135 lens. So I've got that. If you want to play around with these, there is software, and I'll come back to that in a minute, some aspects of software which has improved that you can use on fixing things. Now, let's take another lens that I use quite often. And this one is a Mamiya 645 medium format lens. That means it's got quite a large image circle because it's, got a, it's meant for 645 film. And this is a Photodiox tilt shift adapter. Now I've put some detail, I've got a review of this and I'll put a link to it in the notes for this. And this is not a superb lens in terms of sharpness. The coatings are starting to suffer a little bit on this one here, but it doesn't make that much difference. But um, coatings have improved contrast, they've improved flare resistance and things. So they're, they're another area that's in, of lens design and manufacture that's improved. But this 35 mm is actually a really nice lens. Now, as you can see, it's, it's a relatively complex lens design. So there's quite a lot of bits of glass of different shapes in here. So it was an expensive lens when it was bought. Don't know when this was bought, quite a few years ago. Once again, fully manual, so no EXIF data. So there's the lens. What am I going to be able to do with it? Well, there it is mounted on the EOS RP. In fact, the camera I'm using for shooting this video. Um, it's an RF mount. There's the adapter. There it is with some shift. 35 mil is quite a useful size. I have used this. Um, I, I will take this lens uh, and have used it for architectural work where it happens to be a focal length that I want. Now, I can use a 1.4 converter on a 24 millimeter tilt shift lens. And then I've got to, you know, that, so that gives me broadly around, around 35 mil. But this is quite a nice lens to use. And um, I've got quite a few good photos from it. Now, the, all these photos have had to be fixed a bit. They need to be sharpened. They need to have various little bits of these. So if you're going to use old lenses like this, 
you don't get the ease of use that you get with something like the 2035 where it's all done for you unless you turn it off. The default with this is corrections all on. The default for this is, well, it's your own, it's up to you to decide what you want to do for lens correction. So there's a building. Um, the lens is shifted vertically, so it keeps the verticals of the image uh, of, of, the, of the building straight, so it looks good for that. So that's how I sorted that out. So oh, that's a nice sense. There's another shot. Marshes, and reeds, reed beds at Snape in Suffolk. Um, that is two pictures. That's one with it shifted up, one with it shifted down, and then just flat stitched together. And it's worked really well. It's given me that square format. And even off the EOS RP, which is only, I say only, 26 megapixels, um, added together, that gives me about a 40, 45 megapixel picture like that. So it's perfectly good for, for printing. And I've made prints from these. There is enough detail in these old lenses once you, if you start tweaking them. Now, I mentioned, and I'll, I'll round out on some particular software and how I've been using things. Now, Here's a photo I took when I was testing the Lauer 15mm shift lens for RF mount. So this is on 35mm. Now I'm testing this lens here. Now this is using diagonal shift. So the lens is actually pointing down here. The, set, the camera is pointing here and the lens is shifted diagonally upwards like that. We can see there's some distinct vignetting on it. That's not too bad. Here is the Lauer 15 now, this particular one is got the mount for the Fuji GFX 100S here. So I'm going to be testing this lens on this camera. Now, I can tell you because the sensor is much bigger in this camera than it is on the RP, the vignetting you get at full shift on this one is much more noticeable than it is here on the 35. But I'll be doing a review and notes and covering this particular lens, the lower 15mm shift lens on this camera in due course. But this is an example taken on 35mm sensor. So camera's pointing this direction, its lens is shifted that way. It's darker up the top there. And in fact, if I look, I can see a bit of a loss of detail in that corner, which is to be expected. Any lens, shift lens, if you shift them diagonally, the corner of where you're shifting it is going to be towards the edge of the image circle. Image quality is always greatest in the middle and decreases off axis. And we've got the worst example of it off axis here. So what can I do for that image there to tidy it up and make it look better. Well, the best software um, I'm currently using, and this does vary, and this is software that doesn't need EXIF. So um, there is no EXIF data when you're using one of these adapters or when you're using a manual lens like this one here. There is no EXIF data, so I can't use something like Optics Pro or Photolab. And by the way, DxO have been unable to support shifted lenses since I first asked them about it nigh on 15 years ago. Um, I think they're waiting until somebody brings out a shift lens that actually returns EXIF data and then maybe we'll see support on it, which is a pity because DxO processing is good. But as I say, if it doesn't support your, your lens, you, you, you got, you've got problems. Anyway, there is the corner of that previous image, of that one there. I'm using on this particular one, uh, Topaz Sharpen AI. Why Sharpen AI? Well, Sh Sharpen AI is particularly good for curing image shake, uh, camera shake. Uh, why was I uh, interested in that? Well, I shoot handheld quite a lot. So um, yeah, I'm not, uh, yeah. I do occasionally get images with a little bit of, a tiny bit of camera shake in them. Um, even taking care, you may still get a bit. Turns out, and I found this out testing years ago on the Samyang 24mm tilt shift lens, that the distortions you get in the corners here are very similar to the effects of camera shake. And that means that by applying Sharpen AI in this instance, and I said there are other sharpening tools will work on this as well, but implying Sharpen AI on this just gives me a sharper image. And it really does sharpen things up. Now, 
there's still a little bit of softness in the absolute corner, but consider I'm doing diagonal shift and I've got brickwork in the picture. I'm, I'm almost asking for trouble with any lens, even an expensive lens. I'm asking, you know, I'm, I'm going to get some issues here. So there we have software. And now that's software that's just trying to increase the sharpness or various ways. Um, it works very well. Um, how well? Well, this is also another shot taken with the lower 15mm shift lens on the EOS RP. And that's the picture. And it's that print on the wall there. Um, so that's printed on 24 inch roll paper. Um, so I don't know what the picture is, about 20 by ooh, 20 by 30. And that there is absolutely no problem with sharpness whatsoever. Now in making that picture, I've obviously tweaked a little bit because I've had vignetting to allow for. I've had to increase the sharpness and do all kinds of different bits and pieces. But I've taken a lens, which is manual lens, no settings, and I've used software to fix it. Now, if you combine what we've got in lens design and what we've got in software for fixing lenses, um, you should have no problems in image sharpness. In fact, the problems you end up with are what you take photos of. So I know some people say, well, I don't want the camera doing all this for me. Well, you can turn it off. You can ignore it if need be. I always prefer to start with a sharper image and then work backwards if need be, than start off with a soft image and have to do a lot of work to try and make it usable. Um, yeah, some people prefer the purity of having no software. Well, you get a problem there because you're processing raw files anyway and you're doing all kinds of stuff. So you're always on yeah, shaky ground, I'm going to say there. But there you go. That's a quick overview of why you can get such good pictures from lenses. And the camera manufacturers have an incentive to do this because not correcting as much of the lens of the aberrations in lens design and leaving some of it to software also saves costs. It means you can get better results from cheaper lens designs and cheaper lenses. So the pictures we get from basic kit lenses of cameras now, especially zooms, Zooms are always more complex. Um, it's why I can take an old prime lens from 25, 30 years ago and it works well. If I take an old 25, 30 year old zoom lens, it really will show its age in all kinds of ways. But it means that you know, modern camera manufacturers can make cheaper lenses and give better quality from them. Now, whether you're bothered by that quality part, some of that comes from software, some of it comes from what, that's entirely up to you. But anyway, there you go. Hope that's been of interest and it makes sense, all the sort of stuff I'm doing. And uh, thanks for watching.